Okay, so welcome again to today's webinar called Social Marketology featuring author Rick Dragon. We also have a very exciting little thing for you today. One random attendee that attends live will be selected to receive a signed copy of Rick's book. And I think that this is going to be a, a presentation that's chock full of information. Like I said, I've heard it once before, and I think everyone's going to find it really helpful. And perhaps someone will even... Uh, get to receive the book today from Rick. So with that, let's dive right in. Um, Rick, I thank you for being with us today. Oh, one more quick thing. Um, if anyone has questions for Rick or myself, we are going to have Q&A at the end. So throughout the presentation, go ahead and submit a question. There's two sections. There's chat and questions. Um, prefer to use the question section as it's a little easier for me to organize the questions for Rick as they come in. But go ahead and send them, send in your questions throughout and we'll make sure to try to get to them all at the end of the presentation. So now with that, I'll hand it over to Rick. Thank you, Pam, and, and welcome, everyone. Unfortunately, and Pam, possibly you might look at settings, and if there's a way that I could see the attendees in any chat or anything, it might be helpful. You know, one of the interesting things about doing webinars is you have an invisible audience, so I'm, I'm just going to have to try to vision all of you sitting out there, and I appreciate your, your sharing your afternoon with me. Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit of the thinking behind how this book came to be, and then we'll, it'll also take you into the process framework that we believe will help marketers use social media more effectively. One of the wonderful, wonderful, fascinating things about the entire endeavor of social media is that we get into so many aspects of human thinking and science and sociology psychology, ethnography that taps into human behavior that as marketers, this is the realm that we play in. So even things like, you know, the, and the reason I have these apes, you know, picking at you know, one another, it, it's a process that all mammals do. It's called allo grooming, sometimes called social grooming. And all of us, people do it, and animals do it, mammals do it. And one theory is by a guy named Robin Dunbar, is that chatter and chit-chat and our vocal uh, socializing is an extension of this allo grooming. It, it's our way of using the voice to extend that. And it's, it's known in the animal kingdom that when animals do this with one another, it induces the brain uh, chemicals that give a, a, a feeling of well-being. So it's very, very powerful. But we know that when we use social, that it has a big effect on how people actually behave. There was a wonderful study that got published just this morning uh, that I saw that talked about the, the amount of self-confidence that increases in people when they engage in social. And it's things like that that I think that as marketers just enrich the entire field. Uh, a basic element that I like to talk about is the notion that social media in marketing is truly a revolution. And I know while some people can be a little evangelical about it and, and use a little hyperbole around the idea of it being a revolution. There's a lot of things that point to the fact that in business communications, the world has turned upside down. And a very basic thing that happens often in revolutions is like the poor people in this painting, you know, people get shot, people get hung, people have gotten all sorts of bad things happen to them in revolutions. Not everything in a revolution is good. And what we want to strive for is that on the behalf of our organizations or companies that we actually are, are part of the winning side in the revolution. There's three premises I want to talk about. And one is that, that social media behaviors fall into patterns. And the reason this is so, so very important to us as marketers is in the world of social media, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the constant change of social media. I had someone just last week doing a very deep dive on LinkedIn and mapping out all the various aspects of LinkedIn for our employees. And during that time period, LinkedIn was going through this big, huge change. And it was just so very confusing. But when you step back and look at the platform in terms of behavioral patterns, it, it, you find that it hasn't changed that much. So it's very important to see things in patterns. Uh, one of the things in the book is this idea called the social media pyramid. And this is a device we use to look at various social media platforms. Uh, 
So imagine here that the color white is going to represent 1 on a scale of 1 to 5, and black is going to be 5. Black or 5 means that it's very strong, and white or 1 means that it's very weak. So that we look at these main nine components of social media, and we find that they exist in different strengths on different platforms. So I may look at the concept of identity and how we're really able to flesh out our profile. Now on LinkedIn, you would give that a five. You'd make that black because it's very, very powerful. On Twitter, your ability to do much with your profile is somewhat limited. So we're going to give it somewhere in the middle range. And the other elements that are in the pyramid include relationships, the ability to actually have a relationship with another person, the ability to have conversations back and forth or to exist in groups. Uh, the gaming, and gaming, by that I also mean that gaming behavior, so not just gaming per se, the way you would, on Facebook you have Farmville, but any type of gaming behavior where you might get rewarded very small unexpected paybacks or payoffs. We have the concept of presence, is somebody there or not? On many platforms you don't know whether somebody's actually alive on the other end right now. They could be popping up at any time. On other platforms, their presence is very much visible. Curation is a common concept, as is reputation. Reputation of all these nine elements is possibly the weakest. Uh, one of my favorites is on the SEO Moz social media platform. You can see by someone's contribution that they get a higher score, which is also part of gaming. But you can actually see that they have a higher, uh, they've contributed more, they've replied more, they've gotten more status in the community and thus have developed reputation. And then finally, gifting. And by gifting, I mean a whole world of behavior that includes retweeting or friending or, fa or, or sharing something with someone. You'll often, if you retweet someone, you'll get a thank you back. Pretty good indication that there is an element of gifting there. The interesting thing about gifting is in social media that people feel a very strong compulsion to reciprocate. The rule of reciprocity kicks in and thus as a marketing tool can be very powerful. The second premise is that not all social media marketing endeavors are the same. A lot of times people come in the door they go, hey, I need social media. Well, what type of social media? There's, there's five very distinct types of social media marketing projects that we've identified. So that's very, very important to understand that not all social media is social media. One of those types of projects is what we call brand maintenance. Brand maintenance is when you're doing the very minimum. You have your profiles, you're maintaining your brand, you're up there, and that somebody says something to you or about you that you're there and you're responding. That's the most basic social media marketing project. The second is community, community building or community nurturing. So I can have a community, let's say, of employees. I can have a community of fans, people who love my business. Or I can have a community of people in an affinity group. So that, let's say like, like Red Bull, uh, Red Bull nurtures the community of people who are fanatical about extreme sports. And that's the community that they live in and operate in. They very much do community work. Another is reputation management. Now, reputation management is not just about responding when someone's saying things bad about you, but it also means that you're out there doing proscriptive reputation management, burnishing your reputation in, in the social space. Thought leadership is a huge part, what we call influencer marketing. Now, in influencer marketing, it's, it's a very common approach we take for a service industry, for instance. And we may help people within the organization develop their blogs, develop their own reputation online. It's in fact what I do. I'm giving a webinar right now, so I'm very much doing influencer marketing. We also have an idea of let's identify let perhaps the 20 most influential people in my industry. Let's follow and track them. Let's do what I call professional stalking as opposed to amateur stalking. And <laughs> professional stalking, the person being stalked should never have a feeling that you're stalking them. You don't say thank you for everything. You don't retweet everything. That would just be a little bit too smarmy. And they would feel that and go, what's with this person? Why are they liking everything I put up there? It has to be you know, subtle, has to be well done. But you can really you know, track 
a very small group of people over time read everything that they put out there in social, respond when it's appropriate, and over a period of time develop a relationship that might even move to offline. On behalf of some clients, for instance, uh, we had a, a luxury goods client that we got on the cover of Rob Report, and we could very much track that relationship back to tracking that person and following them on Twitter. The I think that's a, a concept, this whole influencer marketing thing is a concept that I think it's often overlooked in social media marketing. Um, oh, I very think, much so. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, to and, me, uh, it's, it's been one of the most powerful uh, aspects. You know, and it's distinctly different. Imagine if you're selling you know, consumer packaged goods, if you're selling big pens, how that's going to be so very different than if you're marketing a company that does professional services, right? Very, very different. So much easier, you know, if you're dealing with the professional services to get in that realm of influencer marketing. Yes, Next one, yes. uh, uh, you know, the big splash. Uh, the big splash are the type of campaigns that we all know so well. You know, the Mustafa Isaiah actor doing the Old Spice campaign. Uh, fabulous, well done. Was not meant to build community. Was definitely, you know, did actually go after some influencers, but it wasn't, strictly speaking, an influencer campaign. It was really meant to get a big traction. Uh, the Hoodie Remix was a, a beautiful little campaign where people were invited to come in and, and design their own hoodies. I mean, right now, hoodies are pretty popular, but when they came out with this campaign, you know, they were not so popular, and they were trying to revive a really old brand. Uh, the, the Pepsi uh, Refresh Project, where instead of putting millions of dollars into Super Bowl advertising, they decided, let's give this money to America, to nonprofits. And by the way, people, would you please decide which nonprofits get that money? Very much a big splash campaign. Uh, contests of all sorts are big splash. This was uh, one of my favorites. This was uh, where they, they took a video of a person t swimming out to the middle of a city pond on a surfboard while his friends were up on a bridge. And they, they throw a stick of dynamite, and it makes this big wave. And the guy jumps up on a surfboard and rides it out. Of course, you can't actually do that. It was all faked. But the video was extremely viral, got a lot of traction, uh, and just you know, made a lot of wonderful noise. Big splash, both literally, no, no pun intended. All of those have in common big budgets. We see that. They all have in common traditional media support. But then you see a campaign like this, the Blendtec campaign, where this you know, relatively small company that made these really incredible blenders were making videos of blending all sorts of ridiculous stuff. Uh, iPhones or gadgets or watches, anything, and to see if it would blend. And he's got a lot of traction. For a company of this size, actually really helped the company revive itself and, and do some wonderful things. They did not have a large budget, and they did not have big media buys. So I always like to stop and go, well, what causes these various big splash campaigns to succeed? Now, one element that we frequently see is just fun. What is the most fun thing we can possibly make? And fun things do tend to, to get a lot of traction. Now, Pepsi Refresh wasn't necessarily fun. You know, they did something else. The unexpected is very critical. So if you can add fun and the unexpected in some way that it surprises people, has, has a big effect on people, and people like to share that. Uh, the idea of participation. And that's where you see in the Pepsi refresh when they say, hey, people, would you join in with us and help us decide where this money goes? And when people participate in any type of endeavor, and it's part of the power of social media, it has a much more powerful effect. You know, we see this back in old, uh, e well, not email, but real mail uh, things back in the, the 70s where you'd get this postcard and it would say, hey, take the green sticker that says yes and put it on the circle and send this back. And they found that the acceptance rates or the return rates went up by over 50% because people were participating by moving that sticker. You didn't actually have to move the sticker to, to get the subscription, but it worked. That is another, amazing. Right? Isn't that beautiful? Uh, That's amazing. And, uh, another thing that I've seen that, that is very powerful is the idea of transmedia. So your communications and your storytelling not just being replicated from one media to another, but actually flowing across media. And if you look up transmedia, if you're not familiar with it, Google it. 
uh, it's a very powerful movement right now. A lot of very smart people are doing things with it. A guy named Henry Jenkins is doing a lot. This was a campaign by uh, New York City, or actually a Japanese clothing company that is making headway in New York City called Uniqlo. And they had these wonderful messages that flowed from the subway to buses and taxis, but they were a little bit different, and the stories really flowed in a nice way. One of the basic premises of transmedia is that you engage in what's called world building. In a world building, you create an environment in which your participants can join you. And still social media, this is even more important because you don't control the whole story. You're allowing the story to take place. Henry Jenkins, as I, I mentioned, is a person worth looking up, and he talks about these main elements of, of transmedia. Another big theme I'm seeing today is the idea of storytelling. Now, on this particular screen, uh, this is a screen capture from a YouTube video called Liquid and Linked. Uh, it was put out by the Coca-Cola Company and narrated and written by Jonathan Mildenhall, who's their chief creative at Coca-Cola. And in it, they talk about the notion that Coca-Cola is endeavoring to double its revenue by 2020. Now, doubling your revenue for a company the size of Coca-Cola is a little bit like a, a small country saying we're going to double our GMP. This is huge. This is really big. The fundamental way in which Coca-Cola is talking about doubling its revenue is through storytelling. In fact, much of that storytelling is going to take place in social media. But storytelling taps in to something about people's way of thinking that really is much more engaging than simply saying, listen, here's an advertisement for my stuff. The third premise, well, I'm still in my three premises. The third premise, a very important premise with this chat, is that process can be applied to social media marketing. And many of you, if, if you're process geeks, you're like, yeah, that totally makes sense. Many of you will say, what? You're going to apply process to uh, social media? And process doesn't mean that it has to become all rigid and unpredictable. What it means is you know, it's as simple as putting your underwear on before your jeans. It's just how things flow and how the work flows. And because of the newness of social media marketing, it's only been about five years that it's really been around in any important way, the organizations are still struggling to get a grasp of it, which is why I, I want to bring process to bear with it. The process framework that we call social marketology starts off with desired outcomes. Desired outcomes is extremely critical. Now, we, we call it desired outcomes. It's a little bit of an onerous phrase. You might say, well, why don't you just say goals? But it's bigger than goals because we're talking about purpose and we're talking about vision on one side of the spectrum when we talk to business stakeholders. We're also talking about those goals and we're talking about uh, very, very specific metrics. We're talking about the things that can be measured right down to it. So it's an entire landscape of desired outcomes. And every project we do starts off with a, a deep dive into this. Now, when I was writing the book, I interviewed a few dozen social media marketers, pretty big people across the world, the head of social for SAP and Intel, various people. And pretty much everybody uh, voluntarily came out with the notion that, you know, what most social media marketing lacks is an alignment with desired outcomes or goals and objectives. These go from the fuzziest. On the fuzziest side, you've got that vision and purpose, getting finally to a much more clear and measurable sense of very specific metrics. Uh, this is what is in Japan is called an Enzo. You see them a lot on natural food menus and Japanese restaurants. It's a circle. And when you do calligraphy in Japan, it's said that when you draw the circle, the, the calligraphy master can pretty much see into your soul. And it's very defined by purpose. And if your purpose is to impress someone, the, the Enzo becomes about that. But if your purpose is to, you know, to really feel something else, then that comes through. So I try to encourage businesses to think about the idea that the purpose behind what we do can't simply be about making money. It's got to be something bigger. And we need to tap into that something bigger so that when we're in social, that's what we're talking about. Now, this is a quote by Mark Pritchard, the uh, VP at P&G, 
who talks about the fact that they're shifting from a mass broadcast that's getting up on the, the soapbox and yelling at everybody to more of a personal one-to-one -one conversations and primarily in social media. And they very much also talk about that idea of purpose and working from a place of purpose. That's a hard thing for like a dish soap to do. Some of the, the ideas of passion and purpose we see behind brands, you know, the idea of a listening joy that we exist to enable connection or inspire exploration. You know, we see this. Uh, there's a fabulous quote of Milton Hall at Coca-Cola who said, you know, our competition isn't the, the fluid and the blue can. It's Disney and Pixar. We're in the happiness business. And that's, you know, a very different way of looking at things. Or they're in the uh, happiness. Nike, everything is about overcoming physical limits. One of my favorite examples is Red Bull. Everything Red Bull puts out there is about extreme existence. So when you had the guy you know, jumping from the stratosphere, uh, that was about extreme existence. And that's what they're not. They're not about selling you this drink that's going to keep you up all night. They're about that extreme living. Now, if you can tap into the passion behind your brand, the purpose behind your brand, then when you're working in social, it becomes an extremely different game. And that's where you can really start to talk about things that you know people want to join in with. This is a spreadsheet on some of the desired outcomes that we map out. Let me see if I go into that very much. And I don't go into it very much. But uh, the spreadsheet is actually linked. Uh, you can find a copy of it if you go to dragonsearchmarketing.com and click on the social marketology picture on the front page. It brings you to a page, and there's a link to some templates. And this template is there. And we don't just go through business metrics. We also go through all sorts of web and various social media metrics as well. It's just a great way to start every project. But this, this is the first step of every single social media project we do, is we really try to map out all of these very specific desired outcomes. The next part of the big picture is talking about us. And when I talk about us, I'm talking about our brand personality. The idea that a brand has a personality is, is somewhat new. Uh, the idea that a, a corporation can even have a personal entity. You know, it's interesting. The, the first time that this happened in 1886, the county of Santa Clara in California sued uh, Southern Pacific Railroad. And in that law, in that case, it came out that they awarded the corporation the ability to have the protection of a single person. And actually, they, they used the uh, 14th Amendment, which was originally meant to protect slaves, but they used it to apply to corporations. And ever since then, corporate entities have personhood. At, at the uh, Occupy Wall Street, people protested that. They said, you know, we're, we're tired of that. And, you know, I'll believe that a corporation can have personhood when Texas decides to execute one. They don't like this. And yet we know that people, in the way that they behave, is actually very different. We did a study where we took various photographs of people out to people on the street. And we said, look, if a brand woke up one morning, got out of bed, walked across town, knocked on your door, you opened the door, and that brand was standing there, who would it be? And we found that people had a tendency to identify brands with certain types of people. And in this case, we, we found that Starbucks, most people align Starbucks with the soccer mom persona. We were actually surprised at that. I did not think that going into it. Uh, Google, they identified as being a hip young Asian guy. And lastly, and this was probably the most predictable, was that British Petroleum was a very sort of disgruntled middle-aged guy. That one's probably fairly easy. But what the study showed us is that people do, in fact, project persona onto a brand. Now, as marketers, what we can do is we can help craft that. Uh, one of the ways, you know, this is an example of a personal, uh, a customer persona board that somebody may have done for a brand. But we're going to turn this around and, in fact, do it for the brand. What is the brand's personality? And that enables us, ultimately, to speak and consistently speak in social media in a way that helps build that brand equity of a personality. Uh, one of the wonderful tools we use in thinking about brand personality is the five person brand personality traits from Jennifer Acker. Uh, wonderful little chart and you can sort of use it as a way of saying well what describes my brand you know does am I cheerful and, and sentimental or, or am I more you know spirited 
at Dragon Search, we came up with the decision that we were Indiana Jones, that we're able to wear a bow tie and stand at the front of the class and, and talk uh, some smart stuff, but we're also not afraid of putting on the leather boots and going and chasing Nazis with a bullwhip or something. So we would fall into that area of, well, we're a little tough, right? But this is just an idea machine in thinking about your own brand. Sometimes it's good to think about uh, these these five elements, gee, are we a maven? Or are we going to speak with a passion voice? These are just some of the different types of voices we've seen and we've been able to use. Sometimes it's good to think about celebrities. Uh, you know, what celebrity would we be if we were one? Again, this Indiana Jones, uh, another company, you know, said, hey, we're Oprah. You know, that's just who we are. Uh, one company I spoke with had used the persona of Dick Cavett and decided that they were above all Dick Cavett. And if you do choose a celebrity, do choose the movie they're in because obviously if you're thinking Tom Hanks, you want to be perhaps Tom Hanks and Saving Private Ryan and not Forrest Gump. Um, this is not, I'm not putting this up there for you to have to go through reading. It's just an example of a brand voice document. We typically, with every project, will build out this brand voice document. We'll talk about things like the general audiences. We'll talk about things that we don't do. And we'll keep adding these things into the document. We had a client the other day, and we were talking about, oh, let's post on our Facebook page all the great happy hour uh, places to go to around the client's place. And they were like, well, no, we don't ever want to talk about you know, drinking alcohol or, or that sort of flippant fun. So we added that to the brand voice document. We may talk about the different purpose behind different platforms. Here at Dragon Search, for instance, we use Facebook sort of share, oh, it's a fun place to work and potential employees might like to see that. But if we're talking to prospective uh, clients, we're going to spend more time doing that in LinkedIn, perhaps even Twitter. Here's examples, bad examples, good examples. Uh, on the left, OK, this does uh, exemplify the way we want to talk. On the right, no, this is a bad example. Let's keep adding these things to this brand voice document so that as different people on the team work on our social media, they can get up to speed very, very quickly. So after we've, we've got the desired outcomes, we identify more about who we are and our brand personality, the next big thing is who are they? And that's talking about our target audience or our customers or our constituents. Now, we do a piece of work that we call micro-segmentation. It's a very, very important piece of work here in our social media projects. It starts off with a central premise. And in my example, this was actually a client that actually made little figurines of various animals. And we start off with a central premise of, well, who should care about this? And in fact, we started off with animal lovers. And in the world of animal lovers, there's people who love farm animals. There's people who love wild animals and African wildlife. There really are people who are just gonzo over African wildlife. And they're distinct groups of people. Now, with each one of these, we're going to break them off into more uh, fragments, more segments, until we keep getting very, very granular. We're going to fill a whiteboard with this. Uh, the clients themselves may be involved with the whiteboarding session. It might be a group of employees. But we finally get down to a point where, let's say in this case, we get down to Airedale Terriers. And research then indicates that there's even an Airedale Terrier Club of Illinois, very micro segment. So let's find as many of these as we can. And if it's relevant to the pro products we're selling, we can iterate through these micro segments in social media develop relationships and have conversations with these people. But it's a big piece of work. You do this this big brainstorming session, whiteboarding session, and then you copy all these things into an indented Microsoft document or any type of document, Google document. So you end up with this big roadmap of potential micro segments to do. So then the next piece of work, we're going to take these micro segments and we're going to do homework and we're going to find out where these micro segments may exist already online in social media, what communities that they exist in, if they do. So there, we might uncover that there's this group of people that have a LinkedIn group, for instance. We were doing some work for a company that manufactured products to help the sound quality, the, the overhead speakers in hospitals. If you're ever in a hospital and somebody, you know, Dr. So-and-so, please come to the emergency room. And if that sound quality is bad, it can really have a 
big negative impact on health care. If the sound quality is good, it can really have a huge impact. And this company made the stuff that went into hospitals. And when we were doing the research, we actually found out that there was a community of people that were healthcare environmental specialists. So they focused on the environment of healthcare, of hospitals and clinics. They were architects and builders, and that was their focus. And we found this group on LinkedIn so that we were then able to focus in on them and use them. So it's a, it can be a really big, intensive piece of research. Depending on the budget, we may spend hours and hours also doing what's frequently called online ethnography or netnography, where we actually study the conversations happening within these communities also. But then finally, we do the next piece of work. Oops, I'm actually I'm going to go past this, I think. Yeah, that's just where we're going through keyword research to find those communities. We're then going to find out, well, who are the influencers in those communities? Now, the beautiful thing about all of this is that you can sort of see the trajectory of work that we're doing here. Um, let me back up just a second. See the trajectory of work that we do going from our personality, who the, the customers are, the, the smallest granular way, who the communities are, who the influencers are, you can sort of see after that piece of work, you should be ready to be able to do an action plan, understanding those big different approaches to social media that we spoke about before. Now, when we do influencers, we'll typically map them out. So if you're doing an influencer project, by the way, it can be very helpful to identify, let's say, these top 10 influencers, and then let me create a little scorecard where my interactions with them, we can give them different scores. So a tweet might only be a, a two, whereas if they write a blog about it, that may, you know, we're going to give that a five, depending on the level of influencer. So then we finally get into the realm of building the action plan. Now, after doing all this work, I really understand the brand very well and where I can go. Now, the first thing we need to understand is where we want to allocate effort. We typically do this over, let's say, over the next quarter. This is how we're going to allocate our effort. So I'll, right off the bat, I know that I want to put a certain amount of time in the blog, but gee, we're going to allocate more effort to Facebook right now. Right? Uh, there's the four major pieces or types of work that we do with social media. We do the profile work or what we call the digital footprint. Let's make sure that we get out there and own our digital real estate and social media. We then, on that real estate, have to make connections, how many fans or followers we have or that we're following. We have to author and create content. And then finally, when that content is up there, we have to, of course, or we want to engage with people. At that point, we don't necessarily go back into identity work. That may be pretty good. But I can. this is an example for a particular organization where we sort of identified that, gee, in quarter one, we're going to be putting a lot more effort into building out that digital real estate, making sure that all your profiles are properly branded. And we're going to put more effort into building connections, a little bit of effort to content, and very little effort into engagement at this phase. We have a lot of groundwork to do. And you can sort of see that as each quarter of the year progresses, by the fourth quarter, we're much more involved in engagement and putting a lot less effort into digital real estate or even less into actually building connections. Nice way to think about the progression of social media marketing work that you're going to be doing over a period of time. And finally, after we do that, you know, I do talk about the fact that there's these creative solutions. How can we do the creative things? Or if we're dealing in the world of reputation management and dealing with gaffes and faux pas, the bad things. But at any rate, what we're going to do is, is be able to execute our social media project, measure the effectiveness going against those goals and objectives, and then try to reinvent the program. So we'll typically come back around to this process much more quickly the, the final time. And that, that's fundamentally the process. That is the framework. So if you guys have any questions, uh, I'd love to uh, chat with you. Thank you for going through that, Rick. I, I realize you kind of had to speed through in order to make sure you covered it all because it's so much information, um, but it's so much good information. So you know, we can definitely take questions right now. Um, you know, attendees, think about how you might apply some of these concepts to your particular social media campaigns. And in thinking about that, if you have a question, definitely now is a good time to grab Rick ear and uh, ask it now and get an answer now. Um, or, you know, Rick is uh, very accessible on Twitter. Um, he showed his uh, Twitter handle right there, at Rick Dragon. So 
if you think of a question later on, you can reach him there. And um, please, again, use the, the questions uh, section to submit your questions as opposed to the chat section. So we do have some questions. Um, we had a, actually a little funny bit of feedback when you mentioned the stalker thing before. Andrew uh, says that he knows someone like that, but he is a nice guy. So I guess he's, <laughs> I guess he's not creeped out by it. But, right, um, right. But we also have a question on, on the stalking section. And actually, a couple of people joined us a little late. So if you could give like a quick recap of what you were talking about with the stalking. And then the question is, can you give an example about that stalking strategy? Sure, sure. So the idea, and I, I joke and I call it stalking, or we, we do here at the company. We always joke about it. But it's also what we call influencer work, where we may identify a set of influencers that are important to the brand and we'll follow everything that they put out there in social. So if they're blogging, tweeting, Facebook, you know, this type of thing. So for myself, for example, uh, I am engaged personally in some, I, I follow a set of influencers. And every day I open up my iPad and I, I use an app called Pulse to read all these top blogs. So for instance, uh, Avinash Kaushik is, is one of my favorite bloggers. He's a wonderful, smart guy who talks about web analytics, one of the, the smarter people in our industry. But I follow everything that Avinash does. So if he tweets something or puts something on Facebook, I'm, I'm paying attention in a very concerted way. Now, if I was wanting to follow Avinash on, on behalf of the brand and wanting ultimately for him to recognize our brand for some reason and perhaps even engage with us, perhaps tweet what we put out there or blog about us, that might be the effort that I'm after doing. So that's the gist of, of what we do there. Um, I think one of the examples I used where was a luxury goods company where we did, in fact, we identified the top luxury social people in social media and we connected with them. And ultimately, we ended up creating a group on Twitter, a, a tweet chat around lux, luxury, and ended up having some some IRL and real life meetings where once we actually, our people met those people at these real life meetings, we formed relationships and ultimately got a cover of a Rob report that came out of that concerted effort. But really it's about being concerted so that every day or every week we're tapping these people or, or definitely paying attention to what they're putting out there. Thank you for explaining that. Um, it sounds like it definitely works. And actually, uh, another bit of feedback from Andrew about his stalker. He says his stalker obviously helps his presence be seen on social media. You know, the, the, the stalker uh, clicking like on his stuff and everything like it helps spread it around. So sure, sure. It really fosters that, what you were talking about, that sense of reciprocity. Yeah. So you're helping the influencer out by liking their stuff, retweeting their stuff, and then they kind of feel indebted to you, at least to pay attention to find out who you are, at the very least. Uh, you know, um, I actually, Pam, I actually, I, and it's unfortunate that we call it stalking, because of course stalking has this horrible negative connotation, and there's celebrities out there, or non-celebrities, that really are stalked by creepy people. But if somebody wants to get a job, let's say at Dragon Search, I want them to stalk me. I, I, in fact, our latest employee is somebody who he was on my Twitter and he was paying attention and he was responding and he was responding to me on Facebook. And, of course, we're a social media company, so that's, that's a positive to me. He knew what was going on. And that certainly did help him land that job. Great. Um, about the example that you gave about the stalker or the uh, influencer, I'm sorry, uh, the name that you... <laughs> <laughs> I got stalking on the brain now. <laughs> um, how do you spell the name of the person you were talking about? Oh, Avinash Kaushik. A-V-I-N-A-S-H. Kaushik, K-A-U-S-H-I-K, I believe. Avinash, okay. is, is he has a blog called Occam's Edge, or Occam's Razor. I think it's Occam's Edge, uh, referring to Occam's Razor, the, the famous philosophical idea. He's just he's written some books on on metrics and social social media metrics, and he's just a, a brilliant person. Cool. All right, another request for an example. Um, you mentioned faux pas. Can you give an example of that? Oh, we've had so many wonderful faux pas out there, right? There was the. I think that would be hard to find an example. Oh, no, <laughs> that's easy. You know, most recently, of course, somebody on the KitchenAid account tweeted something nasty about Barack Obama's grandmother. 
Uh, that was a, a beautiful example. So imagine being the chief marketing officer of KitchenAid and waking up one morning and seeing that your company's account had tweeted this very horrific, horrible message. Well, it was some rogue employee who was using the wrong software or something. Uh, we've seen other examples where a rogue employee did something on purpose. We've seen many more examples of where too often, like I would say almost probably at least a third of the big faux pas that have happened out there were the case of an employee using, uh, let's say, like Hootsuite or whatever software they were using for their social media broadcasting, and they didn't realize they were in the correct account or the incorrect account, and they thought they were on their personal account. And one of the, the bottom line rules of that is never mix pleasure and, and business when it comes to social media tools. Do, do use different tools because that's right, probably... Right. So that's that's a good bit of advice. Is there anything else that you put in your social marketing plans in the documents in the action plan or anything that helps avoid these faux pas? Well, we certainly have developed a lot of response mechanisms. You know, what do you do if X, Y, Z happens? And you know, one of the important, important things about faux pas, a faux pas is going to happen. Every brand is going to make a gaffe. And unfortunately, so many brands are like, well, that's why we don't want to go into social media, because these gaffes happen is, is absurd, but they will happen. And it doesn't matter if they happen as much as it matters how you respond. Uh, we saw a case with Ragu Spaghetti Sauce had done these videos about uh, blogger mommies in the kitchen. And it was talking about how bad it was when daddies get in the kitchen. And they made this cute, funny video. And they went and shared it with all the daddy bloggers who were not amused. I so, bet. Right. And so one of them, a pretty well-known guy by the name of C.C. Chapman, who's written books, uh, immediately got on there and said, hey, this isn't funny. This is offensive. How could you do this? And it took, I, I think, over three days for Ragu to respond. Wow. So timeliness is really critical. You know, it's just a basic best practice around these types of things, being very quick and responsive, being willing to apologize. Don't be afraid to, to apologize when you goof up. And never be really super, super careful about deleting things that you just don't like. So for instance, when Chapstick had this photograph of a woman bending over a couch showing her tush, right? Uh, and it says like, you know, something, some smarmy line about can't find the Chapstick, you know, where do we hide it? Uh, people were offended by the photograph. They said, Chapstick, we're offended by this photograph. Well, that's OK. It was OK that Chapstick put up an offensive photograph, and it was OK that their audience was offended. What was not OK was Chapstick started deleting the posts where their, their base said that they didn't like the photos. Instead of engaging in a good, healthy conversation about it, they tried to cover it up, basically. And that you don't want to be doing. So if something, you know, every so often, if you, if you get something hateful on your wall, sure, you, you're going to want to remove it. But you want to be very cautious about that. If it doesn't fall into that category, if it's just critical, you don't want to delete it. Absolutely, I agree. And especially while all those eyes are on you, that's the worst time to be behaving like that as opposed to, like you said, just, you know, be human. Admit that you're human. You made a mistake. And... People tend to like that when, when a brand shows that kind of vulnerability. Exactly, exactly. All right, so another question. Um, Bruce says, I understand that you should not be constantly selling, like selling yourself or constantly promoting your brand. Is there a frequency for the sales me me excuse me, message? I am so um, glad somebody asked that question. I love that question because I <laughs> hear People in the professional, uh, digital marketing profession, sometimes I hear them say, listen, it's OK to be self-promotional, oh, every fourth time, or something to that effect. OK, well, there's a problem with this way of thinking. And that is, I go into social media, I form a relationship with someone. We're chatting about our shared passions. And every five minutes, I go, want to buy a car? <laughs> and the problem with that is, is what's called cognitive dissonance. The brain was basing a relationship on, on one set of norms and expectations and agreed upon rules, and then all of a sudden you twisted it. So now I'm not going to trust you 
anymore. Oh, you know the real reason you're here is because you got something to sell me, right? And that comes into play. You know, it's a very, very dangerous thing. It's and we see it in our industry all the time. Look, I'm I'm a marketer, and part of my job is I've I've written a book. I go out speaking. I'm doing this webinar right now, but I will not sell to you guys as my audience in the least because if I even do it a little bit beyond having let's see my logo up there right sure there's my logo I'm not going to totally cover it up but that's it because if I start selling to you even a little bit you're going to get the sense that you can't trust me and you know for the most part for most brands I say avoid self promotion focus on your shared passions with your people now the one exception to that I'll tell you right now Pam um, and folks is I see in what I call love brands and love brands are those brands that people love we're talking like Harley Davidson people love Harley Davidson right Harley Davidson can be promotional because that's why those people are actually they want the promotions from them and every so often you see a brand like that but if you're not one of those love brands don't use social for promotion I, I'm adamantly opposed to it. That's an interesting uh, reaction on your part, but I totally get what you're saying. I think uh, an important thing to keep in mind is to act on social media the way you would act in person, in real life. So just like you wouldn't... <laughs> Actually, maybe better. <laughs> oh, yeah, or better, exactly. <laughs> just like you wouldn't say to someone in every fourth sentence in a face-to-face -face conversation, want to buy a car? <laughs> you know? so don't do that online either. Yeah, but what you might do, you know, and you know, we in the industry love to use the old party analogy. You know, if you're at a party, you, you know, you don't lead with with your sales thing. But you know, at some point in the evening, you might say, "Yeah, by the way, I work down at this place that, that sells cars." You know, you let it be known. Um, I I don't know if I mentioned it in the context of this conversation, but here at Dragon Search, uh, we've our organization. We're a 22 person company. We've grown about 40% year over year for five years. And that I can point to about 40% of our growth from last year as having originated on Twitter. It's a lot of money I'm talking about here. A lot of monthly billables originated with relationships on Twitter. And yet I never went on Twitter going, by the way, I've got this marketing agency. Why don't you give me a call? I've gone right. on to Twitter and I have helped people. I believe in paying it forward, and I've shared my passions with with people, and relationships have formed, and those relationships have grown, and ultimately become business. Now, I don't, I can't say I go on Twitter with the intent of making business happen. I just believe that if you go out there and pay it forward, that business will happen. Now, you might say, "Oof, you know, that's going to be a hard one to sell to my, you know, boss or something." Um, but it's, it's a little faith-based, but it's it's worked for me. Well, I absolutely back you up on that because I built my business off of Twitter in the beginning. Um, I started it on the side before, uh, while I still had a full-time job, so I didn't have a lot of time to do in-person networking and join chambers of commerce or anything like that like I do now. So I spent a lot of time conversing with people on Twitter and really getting to know them, like you said, you know, also just demonstrating my passions and talking about what I was passionate about, and it led to real business. Quite yep. a bit of it, to the point where I grew my business and to the point where I could take it full time. Um, so yeah, I'll, I just absolutely want to back you up on that point. Um, so a couple more good questions here. I want to make sure we get to. We do have a couple minutes, so let's see. Um, how about third party endorsements? Oh, think, third party endorsements are fabulous. Yeah, sure. I, know. Um, I think maybe he's curious about how. Um, they factor into a campaign like this? Do you have examples where you use that? Well, I, I don't tip, I mean, I third party endorsements have always been important to me from the digital marketing perspective, primarily on the website. Uh, you know, using that is, is what I call uh, cap feathers. So if I've worked for uh, the United Nations and somebody at the United Nations says, oh, by the way, Rick Dragon's a really smart guy. I love working with him. And I can put that quote on my website. That, that's a feather in my cap. Hey, it's the United Nations. That's fabulous. And people do like seeing that other people say nice things about me. We do have the world of endorsements, of course, on LinkedIn. We have recommendations on Google Plus and, 
and Yelp and these other things, and they're they're also very important. In fact, from a reputation management viewpoint, you really want to make sure that you have a healthy flow of those things, and occasionally, you know, when it's appropriate, uh, asking a client, "Look, would you mind writing something?" I'd very much appreciate that. So, from that perspective, yeah, yeah, we do it on a constant basis. I think another important thing to note about endorsements is the whole give to get. Um, yes. You know. Yes. Thing it like it, 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 fostering reciprocity. And, so I have you know, I have a little uh, thing about that, Pam. I'll I'll share with you. And from my perspective, for instance, on LinkedIn, I've always believed in not asking for a recommendation, but I would go out and put on the calendar. You know, once a week, let me give someone a recommendation. So that you know, over the course of a year, that's quite a few recommendations. And that if you do that, there's a percentage of those people that will come back and, and reciprocate. And then another person here at the company believes in, in actively going out there and pursuing those recommendations. And they've been doing that. And I can tell you that person has a hell of a lot more recommendations than I do. They, they've really worked it, and they, they have gotten progress. I just, from, a, from my own personal philosophy, I still like the, the paying it forward sort of process myself. It just feel, feels better to me. Right, right, yeah. And all of this, there's going to be a little bit of, you know, what you're, a level of what you're comfortable with in your own yes. style. Yep. Yeah. Um, so another question, social media channels such as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, would the brand be saturated if we use all channels at once? No, um, definitely not. I think he's going with this. It, well, there's two ways to interpret this. Using all the channels at once is, you know, but use it, putting the same message out on all, all channels at once, maybe that's where she was going with that? That I would not do. Yeah, and that, in fact, all of these tools that mass broadcast, you know, I've got a blog post and I'm going to then, you know, post to my LinkedIn and, and Facebook and Twitter directly from that in an automated way, no, don't do it. Don't do it. What, what's so much more powerful is, you know, for instance, if I put a blog post up, uh, I then share it to my LinkedIn. But how I couch it and how I preface it with a little phrase is going to be a little different than how I'm going to put it in Facebook or LinkedIn. By personalizing yeah. each one to the medium, it is more effective. Yeah, I would agree with that. Each each target audience on each platform is a little bit different. Like there's That's the people right. on and, and you know the the, uh, the old uh, judicial uh, rule of thumb that avoid the appearance of impropriety, right? Uh, and even though it's not a big deal, if somebody notices that you're you're mechanically posting something from one to another and it's not personalized, it can you know just feel a little wonky. And you don't want to give that feeling to people. I you know, socialize. Yeah, and, and Pam, it gives I know the you, impression that you're not present, that you're not really online there to talk. Exactly, exactly. You know, the, the best social media communications I've seen, and, and I'm not the best in the world. I've seen people who are really absolutely brilliant at it. We, we have a young lady who works here at the company, and she is pure genius when it comes to Twitter. And she just has a great way of personalizing her little pieces of communication, you know, and she'll use like little stage things like leans in and listens, you know, uh, little notes like that and personalizes things that really makes them feel like she wrote it just for you. And they're absolutely brilliant. So when you see various social media communications, there's a big difference between people just sort of posting something, oh, here's a cool link. I thought this was cool. Uh, if they're somehow able, you know, this is the best way to start my day with coffee. Beautiful. You know, I mean, it just adds a little more something to it. And you want to, you know, discover that voice for yourself and social as much as possible. And just going right. and posting across multiple platforms at the same time just isn't going to do it. Yeah, someone just mentioned something in the questions about holiday greetings and whether they're cliche. I think you're, that's kind of the point you're on to. If you just blast a, you know, happy Thanksgiving message across all platforms, it's not exactly personalized like like the way that person right, would do it on Twitter. Right, right. But, but let me tell you a little story with that, though. Because, you know, social media, like anything, we do have differences of opinions amongst people who do this for a living, right? So uh, we might get into some good arguments and be banging our, our beer bottles on the table and saying, no, this is the way you should do it. Um, I heard a lot of people say that they were utterly, one of the people in social media that I really have a great deal of respect for, high, high respect for, I still do. And she said, I can't stand it when people say good morning. 
on Twitter. <laughs> it annoys me. Why do they have to say good morning or good night? You know, and yet I know someone else who every single morning of the year gets up and takes a photograph of the lake view from Chicago, of the sun rising over the lake, and they post it on Twitter every single morning, and they say, good morning, world. Wow. And people come back and they say, good morning. And this huge community of people have, have built up around these good morning photographs, and they share them, and they love them, and they actually have contributed a lot to this person's active community online. Uh, Jeff Pulver, the, the founder and director of the 140 Conf, he'll frequently every morning come on and say, good morning, world. So here you've got a difference of opinion, though, where you've got some people who are really respectable who do this in a way that's effective, and you've got other people who are like, you know, I don't, I don't think this is cool. Um, well, I think it's more than a difference of opinion. It's a difference of approach. I mean, that, the one good morning that consists simply of a text tweet is a whole lot different than a good morning followed by a photograph from this morning. Right? Yes, that is different. Yeah, so I think there's different. different ways to say things like that that can yeah. add that little extra oomph that gets you noticed and well, doesn't makes it not sound cliche then. Right. Um, all right, clock is running down, but I have a, a quick curiosity. If you could just comment quickly on uh, several of the things mentioned here. Um, we talked about using teams to implement social media strategies, like you know, using a brand voice document, make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, but what about people that do that are kind of one man bands or they have one marketing person? Like how much of this planning and process do you still suggest doing um, when you remove that need to manage a team of social media people? Still extremely, extremely useful. So even for a, a one person company. So I was speaking with uh, someone earlier today who is a consultant. He travels all over the world. It's him basically. And he works for banks. You know, it's still a perfect opportunity for him to map out each of these aspects. He may know what he's trying to achieve. Hey, it's my business. I know what I want to do. I want to grow my revenue from, you know, 100k to 200k next year. I want to be having better clients or more fun to work on. I I know what I'm trying to achieve. Well, great. You still map it out. Even for your own thinking, it can be very valuable. Even developing the brand voice document. Well. Who do I really want to be? It reminds me that perhaps I may not want to be so flippant, or I may not, if it's not in alignment with my personal brand, I see something that I'm sort of tempted to be critical about, maybe, I'll, maybe I won't do that. So it's not a bad thing, even for a solopreneur or a very small company to go through. It's very valuable. I would agree. I was working with a client the other day on a Facebook strategy plan um, and we were working on a section that's kind of like your brand voice document. And even though it's just him that's going to be doing all the posting, laying it out and just writing it out on paper, the types of things that he should be sharing that are on brand and the types of things he should not be sharing that are off brand, he was just like, wow. Like, you see this <laughs> like, geez, why do I do that? Why do I share all this stuff? I don't know why I do it, but right, I do. Right. Well, I'm glad I have this so that I remind myself to not. <laughs> yeah. It really, I, yeah, I think it can help to write out things um, even when you don't need to for the purposes of managing a team. All right, so we're right down to the wire here. We're going to do the exciting part. We're going to give away a signed copy of Social Marketology, Rick's book, with all the concepts that he just explained and much, much more. I have a copy. I enjoy it very much. I haven't read it all yet, but I am looking forward to reading more of it because it, it really is good stuff. So my highly scientific method of just kind of swirling my mouth around and randomly picking to <laughs> close my eyes and see which one I land on. Um, okay, I landed on Ashley Rojas. So congratulations, Ashley. You've won a copy of Rick's book, Social Marketology. If you can email me at pam at pamandmarketing.com with your shipping address that you would like that sent to, I'll pass it on to Rick, and we will get that out to you. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Rick, for, for being here with me today and doing this presentation again. I really enjoyed hearing um, this again from you. And we got a lot of good uh, feedback here. People are saying thanks for the webinar and great uh, principles. And even uh, Jeff Belanger says Rick Dragon for president. <laughs> I think you know him. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> so, but lots of good feedback. So thank and you, And any of you not connected with me on Twitter, please, please do. I'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. Yeah, to keep up with both of us is to, oh, and a quick question, Rick, do you have anything upcoming, any events or anything you want to let us know about? 
Well, there's, if any of you are in the New York City region, there's the Bright Conference in March. I don't have a specific date, but if you look up B-R-I-T-E Conference, it's Columbia University. It's one of my favorite events in the New York region. Uh, I'll be at Social Media Marketing World in San Diego. I believe that's in April. That's uh, off of Social Media Examiner, worth checking out. Uh, those are two big events. And if any of you are in Oslo in, in April, I'll be there also. I'll, I'll be around. Uh, if you touch base with me on my website, I'll, I'll, I post my events there. I'm at quite a few. OK, great. And uh, I have a webinar coming up next week that is called um, The State of Social Media 2013. And actually, it's a Google Hangout, I should say, not a webinar. It's going to be a live broadcast Google Hangout with Lena West. If you know Lena, you'll know how awesome she is. If you don't know her, you should know her. She's incredible. So. Um, I will send out, where I am going to send out, someone asked you for getting a recording of this. I'm going to send out the slides and the recording in an email, um, probably tomorrow or later today, to all of the attendees. So you will get a copy of these slides and this recording. And I'll also mention the information about the, the Hangout there. Um, so I think, I think that is it. Was there anything else I was going to mention? No. Um, so thank you again so much, Rick. And uh, thank you for everyone, everyone for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Take care, all. Bye. Take care. Bye.